this because a lot of it is telling you what the notes are. A um, whole lot of it, especially babies. Now, the only thing I would say to you about this side of the board, because I'm going to talk about this on the other side of the board. When it comes to complicated labor procedures, you have that, um, you have a handout. Let me see where it is. By the contraction handout. You did your stages of labor. Uh, let me ask you, because I don't remember. When it comes to this bottom part, did I say uh, the patient may have chills? Did I do that yet? No. Okay, we didn't do Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dirty Duncan placenta. Okay, fourth stage. Make sure you know the patient can have chills, and that's normal. And remember what I said. Fourth stage is four hours. Four and four. Stage four is four hours. So it starts after you deliver the placenta, and it doesn't end for four hours. Now, the fundal height, which is very important, if this was a full-term patient, the fundal height right after the placenta comes out is, is either at the umbilicus or one above the umbilicus. You write it like that, one above you. One above the umbilicus. This is a stage of diuresing, which means you're going to pee a lot. And it can cause a hemorrhage if the patient isn't able to actually pee. Their bladder can fill up really quick and it can cause a hemorrhage, postpartum hemorrhage. This is a time when mom and baby are bonding. Uh, mom and baby need to eat a little something. Baby needs to eat, period. Mom needs to eat a little something uh, per her preference, whatever. No limitation, obviously. She can drink whatever she wants. Pain management, ice to the perineum. Don't forget that. Ice to the perineum at this stage. So comfort measures or ice to the perineum, encouraging hydration, nutrition. Those are all your nursing care during that stage. A warm blanket right out of the oven is what we usually do. Her vital signs should be relatively normal. Of course, she cannot go to the bathroom by herself. She needs assistance that first time around if she's lost a little bit of blood. So that's important. Okay. Uh, now, if you turn to, I think, your next page, after the contraction page. Yeah, it talks about uh, station and some things I want to put on this page. There's a lot of confusing words, thankfully not on NCLEX, but definitely in your packet, a lot of confusing words. One of the confusing words is fetal lie. And what I would say to you about that is Transverse is bad. This is maternal axis. Dot, 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 dot. It's called a spine. Transverse lie is baby's spine. It's like this. They're at right angles. Bottom line. 
bad, obviously, for y'all. Okay, so that's one. So the best one is to be longitudinal, where everybody is parallel. Okay, so that's good. Longitudinal is a good lie. Presentation You either have a cephalic or breech. With a breech baby, you can have head entrapment. And a prolapse cord. So these are your C section. We try something called a breech version, which means we try to vert or convert the baby to cephalic presentation from the outside. So we take our hands and we mush and push and shove the kid <laughs> all around the belly till we get it back to cephalic. Shove, shove, ultrasound, shove, shove, ultrasound, shove, shove, ultrasound. And I had a wonderful doctor, Kevin Muse, a good friend of mine, who had about a 100% success rate. <laughs> like a 3% failure, maybe. All my patients were verted. But then he moved to New York and we lost that wonderful person. Because if we can turn the baby, then you don't get a C-section. And he was able to turn most. Head entrapment, prolapse cord. We will try a breech, breech version to convert the baby, shove, shove, push it back down the head. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so that's that. No. No, 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 no. Leopold's maneuver is part of your nursing assessment on admission, where you're trying to feel the head and the butt versus the butt. So when we look at position, we are going to do Leopold's maneuver the patient who is cephalic or vertex these are good both of these mean head down the patient who is cephalic or vertex position or presentation they're going to have their baby's head is hard and it pivots really easy. So hard, when it's the head it's hard and it pivots, moves under your fingers, perfectly round. So there's no reason why after 30 years I can't tell you whether you're vertex or breech. So all nurses know this. The patient's baby's bottom, kind of oblong, does not wiggle like a head does, doesn't really move as much, doesn't pivot as well, softer. Remember that the fetal heart rate is best heard over the baby's back. Now, if you turn, uh, well, that page, do a highlighter. Get your highlighter and highlight the zero. And make sure you write, when you're at zero station, it is said that you are engaged. The baby is engaged in the pelvis. Zero station, the baby is engaged in the pelvis. This baby is at the level of the ischial spine. They're at the level of the ischial spine. Now, if you turn the page, you'll see a nice example of that.
So turning the page, you'll see the baby's top of their head. This baby is said to be engaged. You draw, you highlight that line going all the way across. And that is showing you on the left side, it even says ischial spines. On the right side, it says bipyramidal diameter. Okay, so you have a couple things to do. Now you have a lot of room on this, so I want to put some procedures. First of all, if we want to try to induce the patient, there are lots of ways to do it. I'm going to write them all down. Some of them I have written, but I want to put natural ways first. These are natural ways. Um, patients will tell you uh, castor oil. They'll tell you uh, black cohosh. However, these are not what the nurse tells you. This is on the list. And then we have something called prostaglandins. Oh, wait, before you put prostaglandins, put AROM, which is artificial rupture of membranes. Just breaking the water will do it. Then you can put prostaglandins. And that's up here. I have to write it over. Prostaglandins, you may be wondering how does sex play a role? Well, prostaglandins is in semen and it causes the patient to go into labor. We give the patient something called Cytotec, which is a type of prostaglandin. Sometimes we use a pill, sometimes we use a gel. If those things don't work, we can try something a little bit less. Uh, scary than Pitocin. We can blow up a Foley catheter balloon. We can inflate, I should say, a Foley catheter balloon with the water that we use and do it in the cervix, stretching the cervix out. And then there's the mean, hateful, rotten Pitocin that everybody hates. And of course, Pitocin is not without risk. When you induce labor, you increase the risk of a C-section automatically. So you know that. Okay. If you turn to the next page, I want to show you something at the bottom. There's lots of room. I want you to write this. Number one, if we use an external fetal monitor, the toco, the toco is for the contraction and it goes around the belly button, right above it or up to the side. The toco, the word toco means contraction. And in order to monitor the contractions, you need to put the toco above the belly button in a full term patient off to the side one way or another, or even just right above it. The ultrasound is the part that gets the fetal heart rate. That is below the belly button over the baby's back. Mm -hmm. The toco means contraction, and that monitor is put above the belly button, off to the side one way or another. The ultrasound is for the baby, and that monitor is going to go right over the baby's back. And, uh, and the ultrasound goes below the belly button. So down here, somewhere off to the side, one way or another, wherever the baby's back is. Now, internal monitors, don't forget, the water has to be broken. We just gave you external fetal monitor. For internal monitors, the water has to be broken. And that is a risk in and of itself. Nurses can put them on 
The fetal scalp electrode is invasive. It goes right on the baby's head, underneath the scalp. Fetal scalp electrode. Okay. If a baby is in distress, we do something called a fetal scalp pH. We have to do a C-section if it's less than 7.21 for the pH. We do a C-section if the scalp pH is less than 7.21. Because now we're in, for the baby's sake, we're in acidosis. That's acidosis for the baby. Their pH is a little different. Okay. Amnio infusion is done for meconium stained fluid and variable deceleration. Amnio infusion is done for meconium stained fluid to thin it out and variable decelerations. Variable decelerations. Now, just so you know, there is a trick for heart rate monitoring and the mnemonic is veal chop and that's why you need all that space somewhere on that sheet you got to line these up together four letters four letters the V is for variables V is for variables Oh, you know what? Nope. I, you've got a handout on this. Thank God. I don't know if it's on the next page. Yep, it is. Yay. So put your veal chop on there. Don't kill me. But you actually have a handout on this. So write your veal chop the way I did. And then we'll talk about what they mean. So here we go. Variables in the fetal heart rate look a lot just like the V. They look just like a V. And they mean, if you go straight down, cord compression. There is someone, something happening to the cord. Labor decreases blood flow to babies, and it can squeeze the cord. Mommy could be laying on the cord. The baby could be laying on the cord. The cord could have a knot in it. It could be around the neck. It's just a million different things that could be going on with the freaking cord. But every single contraction, if you're getting these variables, then there's cord compression. Another reason why the cord might get squished it's because there's no cushion in there. The cushion is called water. Amniotic fluid is water that cushions the cord with every contraction. So if your patient's water broke like my daughter's did 20 some hours earlier, then the cord is going to get compressed because there's hardly any water in there. So the cord is getting smushed. If you think about it, if I take my finger and I press on the vein that I'm clearly looking at, after a while, it's going, to get, it's going to get real old. If I put a pillow here and try to do the same thing, I can't. It's the same thing with water. Water is a cushion or a pillow. 
around the cord. So sometimes when we see this on the monitor, we say, oh, let's try an amnion fusion. Let's put some more water back in there. Maybe it'll work, okay? When we put an amnion fusion up, we're putting water back in the uterus, trying to cushion that cord. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, E. This stands for early D cells. And that stands for head compression. This is one that's good. I think all of us would agree what goes up must come down. So if you're getting head compression, baby's coming out. So early D cells are wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And they mirror the contraction. They mirror. They look just like an upside down contraction. Variables look like a V. So when it comes to the fetal heart rate, if I'm the nurse and I see this early D cells, I'm going to get the room ready. I'm going to see if my doc's in town. <laughs> I mean, not in town, but obviously in the hospital or close. I had five offices. You better make sure I'm nearby because I have a lot of offices. So if you see this, you're going to call me. And obviously as a nurse, depending on your hospital policy, almost every hospital allows it, you would check the patient to see, uh-oh, where are we? Because <laughs> it's easy to go from like five to ten in someone who's had kids before, and you don't want to be caught off guard because then you're going to deliver the kid. Uh, a is acceleration, and we say, okay, good. So O for okay. The bad O and A meaning, because this can mean good or bad, accelerations are always good. Let me clarify that. Always good. But what could be bad, and we can use this mnemonic to represent bad as well, is an absent variability. And when you see me do this, this is variability. This is absent variability. A flat line in you is about as bad as a flat line in the baby. The baby is obviously alive, you aren't. But I mean, a flat line is bad for both. Absent variability, flatlining in the baby means give O2 and it's not getting any. So if it means something good, you can say on your test, oh, accelerations, okay. If it's a bad meaning, absent variability means O2 because you're not getting any. Okay, so you have two different things you can use the O and the A for. The worst thing on earth, late D cells, placental insufficiency. This placenta is not getting anything. This placenta is not getting any O2 at all. I mean, it's not getting anything. Baby's sick of you. It's time to have a baby. Now, this is going to be, when you see late D cells, we're going to need something called uterine placental resuscitation and of course we have a little system the first thing we do hmm, I can't spell the first thing we do is change maternal position Her, if she's on her left, put her on her right. If she's on her right, put her on her left. If she's, you're tired of that shit, put her on her hands and her knees. Change her position. 
And we do this also with these variables. If she's on the cord, get her off. So change maternal position, O2 per face mask. Open IV wide, IV fluids wide. That means open it all the way up. Not increase it, but open it all the way up. Wide open. Turn Pitocin off if it's on, because that's making matters worse. And notify nurse midwife or MD after it's all said and done. Okay. So that's that. Epidural, we'll talk about this later, epidural and subarachnoid block. Just remember with an epidural, it may be contraindicated with HELP syndrome. If your platelets are low and you poke me in my back, I'm going to continue to bleed, which is crazy. So epidural and subarachnoid block may be contraindicated in a patient with really low platelets like HELP syndrome. Remember that a subarachnoid block is a spinal. A subarachnoid block is a spinal. That's what that is. Those two are very different. You have to monitor this patient's bladder because sometimes they can't go on their own. Monitor their bladder because they can't go on their own. And remember the number one side effect is itching. A complication is a spinal headache, which is kind of common. and a vacuum extraction. Forceps, I call it salad spoons, vacuum, hoover maneuver. But these things are obviously not what we like to do. It's what we have to do in the case of fetal distress. So forceps or vacuum. Make sure you know the water has to be broken. There has to be an episiotomy, which I put up under there for you. You can't do a forceps or a vacuum without an episiotomy. So you absolutely have to have this patient cut in order to put big ass equipment inside of them. Okay? Salad spoons, Hoover maneuver. It's not going to fit normally. And obviously these are bad. I mean, you know, they're life saving when we use them, but they're still bad. And they increase the risk of jaundice in the baby and intracranial hemorrhage. C-section. There's lots of reasons for C-section. Let's give you most of them. Placenta previa. Severe placenta abruption. Breach, shoulder, or chin presentation, prolapse cord, fetal distress, Cephalo, pelvic disproportion, and previous C section. And multiples. So twins and triplets and 
sometimes they don't want to behave or get the memo. Triplets are really interesting. Twins you might can work with vaginally. Triplets, I only know one person that delivered them, uh, vertex and vaginally, I should say, and that was an OB nurse who refused a section. <laughs> so um, remember, the patient has a right to refuse, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, cephalopelvic disproportion would take this one and make sure you know the labor usually is dystocia. This is labor dystocia usually. In other words, the patient gets stuck and doesn't move, and then we try Pitocin, and it doesn't help, and all this other kind of crap. And after a while, we throw in the towel and say, okay, you're not doing much here. Now, the VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean section, VBAC, after. Vaginal birth after C-section, I have a huge success rate with that, but it is a risk of a uterine rupture. There is a risk of a uterine rupture with this, obviously. So, you know, it is what it is. Because of the risk of a uterine rupture, I put, and you would uh, agree that you need internal monitors in the uterus, internal monitors for that one.